Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, just to kick us off, I will um, welcome Moses Kulaba from Natural Resource um, Governance Institute um, to give a few remarks before uh, we start our today's session. And once again, I would like to welcome you all. Thank you indeed, Amos. Good morning, everybody, all of Africa and beyond who's joining us this morning. Once again, it's our pleasure as usual to have you join us again on this session. My name is Moses Kulaba and I'm the East Africa General Manager for NRHI. It's indeed our pleasure that you're joining us this morning once again for such a wonderful long journey. Again, that we have started, we started a few, minutes, a few months ago and we shall be continuing. Without wasting a lot of time, I'll now hand over to Amos Wemanya from uh, Tax Justice, I mean, sorry, from Parshift Africa, who is going to be the moderator of our session. I'll be joining you again later towards the end, just for a few concluding remarks and, of course, giving the way forward. Welcome, Amos. Uh, thank you, Moses, and welcome, friends. Um, as we all know, um, Africa is at crossroads. We are facing the challenges of climate change that needs to be addressed. And at the same time, Africa needs to develop and bridge the existing inequality gaps. As we seek to address these intertwined uh, realities, energy transition and resource extraction is at the center. Although Africa has the lowest carbon emissions footprint, it is among uh, the continents most uh, impacted by the climate crisis. So therefore, to address the climate challenges and meet Africa's development aspirations, a large-scale mobilization of political and economic capital is required. Shifting from carbon intensive to low carbon economies will require development and harnessing of resources. Political economy considerations and geopolitics have always been at the core of resource extraction and utilization. Climate change and the need to decarbonize economies, including energy transition, is redefining geopolitics. The, the geopolitics of access to and control of vital resources. African civil society have previously expressed concerns about the existing global inequalities in the energy transition arrangements. It is therefore important that civil society, citizens and all stakeholders understand their interests and contribute to just energy transitions in Africa. Therefore, friends, today's session is part of an ongoing East and Southern Africa civil society energy transition, a joint capacity building, and a road to uh, COP27, organized by Natural Resource Governance Institute, Oxfam, pay, uh, publish what you pay, um, and Tax Justice uh, Network Africa, Eco News Africa, and Power Shift Africa. So um, in this um, session, we will discuss existing views on the energy transition, highlighting viewpoints I'm highlighting viewpoints in the global north, um, the global south um, as well, and the contrast between them. Um, the goal is to discuss the implications of these perceived conflicting narratives and to address the existing myths that may prevent African civil society organizations and indeed all stakeholders, um, including um, government from developing a coherent agenda for Africa. Participants, We'll explore, um, we seek to explore, uh, including our speakers today, we'll explore alternative pathways to achieve net zero and sustainable development without compromising or limiting Africa's development vision and aspirations and ensuring a just transition for Africa is realized. So uh, with that, uh, I don't know whether Peter has joined us. Uh, Peter is going to give us opening remarks uh, for this session. Thank you very much, Amos. Apologies, because I think I was hanging elsewhere. I hadn't been allowed in as the, the panelist. Sorry for that. But but the, thanks very much, Amos. Um, I think you have you have started as well. I just want to 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 thank you and um, and also to bring you greetings from Oxfam and particularly the, the totality of Oxfam in Africa, a continent we have a long history and passion and hope and believe in. I really also want to, on behalf of all of us, the organizers, to thank the organizers, Natural Resource Governance, Echo News, Publish What You Pay, Tax Justice Network, Power Shift Africa, and of course, my own Oxfam for pulling this together. And especially assembling 
a very solid panel, and which includes some of our, our leading thinkers on the issues of energy and transition and extractive and climate in the continent. I'm particularly pleased to see uh, old colleagues, including Titus, who until a few months ago was a colleague leading our fight uh, for, for social justice and on EIs in Southern Africa. And uh, Titus, good to see you. And I think OSF was, was very wise to take you up uh, from us. Where are we coming from on, this, on these matters of energy and transition and climate? Um, many of us will know that through the Paris Agreement, developed and developing countries committed to actions to limit average increase in, in global temperatures to below two, two, two degrees and to pursue efforts to further limit this to 1.5 above pre-industrial levels. Now, capping this global warming to the levels that I have mentioned will require that global emissions reach net zero by 2050. This is, this is ambitious, of course. Uh, and meeting these energy targets will require quite a lot of political will and economic capital. And we are not seeing enough of that yet, of course, to accelerate the process for replacing this carbon intensive energy infrastructure. However, we know that many African countries are at crossroads, they're actually in dilemmas between meeting climate change commitments, exploiting their oil and gas resources to addressing glaring energy poverty and raising domestic revenues for them starting their economies, still reeling from the shocks of COVID-19 and now also a war in Ukraine, which we have had nothing to, to, do, to do with in terms of its causes. At the same time, the effects of climate change are real, they are not deniable, including of course, what we see today, a very present huge droughts in the Horn of Africa in the Sahel, and also, you know, very recurrent storms in Southern Africa. On the oil and gas sector, several African countries are gearing towards commercial production of their new foreign oil and gas resources, including my own Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, and a number of other countries. The countries like Uganda, where I come from, are full of hope that finally they are on takeoff. I recall a meeting we had in 2019 with President Museveni, I think Gerard will remember that. In 2018, we had a meeting with Museveni and he said, in many ways, he was saying that, you know, finally our problems are behind us. There was a sense that, you know, all these issues that we have been struggling with are finally being resolved. But of course, that was hinged on oil, which is now clearly, of course, will very quickly become a stranded asset if, 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 if everything we see, I think, comes to bear. So how do we win such countries from dependence on oil uh, without collapsing their economies and worsening inequality? How do we ensure that African countries that have traditionally contributed least to overall global carbon emissions are not disproportionately punished for the sins of the leading global emitters so that yet again, we suffer more centuries of staying behind? Part of the answer must not only be on what we will do with the reality of standard oil assets, but also how we maximize the benefits from critical minerals that we need to resource the inevitable energy transition. We know that Africa has historically remained an exporter of raw minerals with limited participation in the entire mineral value chain. We know that we have glaring gaps in natural resource governance so that whatever has been there has also not benefited people, uh, but only the elite, of course, with their corporate friends. The EU Agenda 2063 envisions African countries being able to harness their natural resources, such as minerals to benefit countries and people. So scaling up renewable energy options will require quite an unprecedented increase in production of critical minerals, such as copper, cobalt, lithium, iron ore, and rare earth elements, many of which are available in the continent. So the limited supply and race to control the critical mineral extractive resources could, and shall I say, fuel corruption and conflict rather than power development in supply countries. I had a meeting recently with the former president of Nigeria, President Olusegun Obasanjo, who told me that, you know, my son, uh, just the other day, I learned that between DRC and Zambia lies 70% of the world global resources. The challenge of every African is to see how these resources will benefit the people of the continent. I believe the organizers of this webinar have convened this conversation so that in my opinion, we can begin to answer some of the most urgent questions and address these dilemmas facing Africa, but also point us to the opportunities we as a continent should seize in terms of energy transition. How should Africa position itself to ensure that the inevitable and imminent mineral boom is beneficial to its people so that we don't lose the century yet again? How do we, as I conclude, leverage the Africa mining vision in the era, in this era to ensure that African citizens 
are part of the energy transition in participatory and meaningful ways. Today's discussion will provoke our thinking about geopolitical considerations of energy transition in Africa and hopefully generate key issues that our political leaders in the continent and the world need to consider so that we ensure a truly just energy transition for the people of this continent. A transition that reduces, not increases the huge inequalities we have seen. I welcome you all and wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I'd like to end there. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Peter has really um, presented us with great questions. That, um, I think our speakers today will try to respond to issues around stranded assets, um, shifting power dynamics, and also ensuring that Africa uh, participates in the whole value chain of resources that um, are extracted from the continent. So um, to take us through that, uh, we have today two speakers. Uh, one of them is Dr. Victoria Nalule and uh, Titus Gwemende. Uh, Dr. Victoria Nalule is a lawyer and uh, an energy and mining expert with extensive experience working on various projects in different parts of the world. She holds a PhD in international law and policy she is an energy and natural resources um, law lecturer at the University of uh, Bradford in the United Kingdom. Victoria is an author and has widely published on topics relating to oil, gas, uh, renewable energy, climate change, mining, and international arbitration. Her latest uh, five books covering energy, mining, land access, and extractives, energy arbitration, and negotiation in uh, extractives. Victoria offers extensive experience in the energy and mining sectors, having worked with various institutions, regional and international organizations, including assignments for the Queen Mary University of London and uh, uh, among many others. Um, she has presented as a speaker and panelist in several forums and conferences, and therefore Victoria is not new in the civil society space. Uh, we also have Titus uh, Gwemende from Open Society Foundations, uh, Didras is the Division Director, Africa Office, um, in the Opportunity and Equity Department. Uh, Titus is a long-standing uh, justice advocate and a Pan-Africanist. Um, so with those introductions, um, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Victoria Nalule. Welcome, Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Amos, for the introduction. And thank you very much, Oxfam and all the other partners for organizing uh, these important webinars, series of webinars. Uh, let me try to share my slides. There are just a few slides. So. Is that clear? Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see the slide. Oh, okay. All right, so the issue of energy transitions, especially the geographies of energy transition is a very important one in this 21st century because we might start by asking ourselves, what exactly is, in, is this energy transitions? What does it mean for the global north? What does it mean for the global south? And honestly, there is no agreed in, uh, international definition of what energy transition means. Different scholars, different experts, and different organizations have defined this term differently. But what we can all agree on, or what has come to be accepted uh, as a global definition in summary is, energy transitions is a shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy. But remember, the energy sector is not just about fossil fuels and renewable energy. It's not oil and gas versus renewables. The energy sector, it's a very big sector and it's very key for the economic development of every country. Energy is what we see everywhere. It's what we're using right now, the electricity we are using, the fuel, for that, the fuel that powers our cars, uh, also the fuel that is used in industries, uh, the electricity that we use in hospitals, in schools, that is energy. And um, a brief description of what energy transition means or definition 
sometimes it has caused lots of problems. It has caused lots of concerns because the same concept has been used to, uh, to mislead people, to mislead governments, to mislead organizations, especially with respect to how the energy sector should be governed. Many people have used the word energy transitions to think that it's time for us to say goodbye to oil and gas, which is not true. Like that is a very big misconception that has caused problems. Even right now, we are seeing an increase in fuel prices, in oil and gas prices in different countries, in Africa, in America, in Europe. We're experiencing a global energy crisis. And although the war in Russia and Ukraine has played a big role with respect to this global energy crisis, but we cannot also forget the fact that previously, people were paying a lot of attention to issues with respect to energy transitions and climate change. And we're seeing lots of protests, climate change activists coming up saying it's time to say goodbye to oil and gas. These are all misconceptions that have escalated the global energy crisis. So in this discussion or in this slide, in, this brief sli in the brief slides, I just want us to understand the geographies of energy transitions and also to state the fact that energy transition does not necessarily mean shifting from oil and gas to renewables. We need to take into consideration the progressive character of energy use. In 2020, I came up with the concept, the noble concept that I call energy progression, implying that each country and each region should be given a chance to progress from one energy use to another. Because when you're talking about the energy sector, you have to talk about the different types of energy. We have bio, bio energy, we have biomass. We're in sub-Saharan Africa, over 600 billion, billion people lack access to electricity. In rural areas, over 70% of most people in rural Africa, they're relying on, on traditional energy, that is bioenergy. Bio so when you're talking about energy transitions, you have to ask yourself, what exactly are you transitioning from? Because it can't just be oil and gas. You also have to think about what are people using for, for their lighting? Are they using electricity? Are they using candles? What are people using for cooking? Are they using firewood? Are they using gas? So this transition, the first thing you need to ask yourself, what exactly are you transitioning from? And for the people who lack access to electricity, the question would be, what are they transitioning from if they don't even have the modern energy? So that is really very key for policymakers, for the civil society to really understand the basics of these terms, because in most cases, misconceived concepts often lead to misconceived solutions. And in the energy sector, it's no longer a job because with the energy transitions and climate change, we're seeing lots of threats, especially financial risks that are associated with oil and gas. So all those are issues that really have to take to be taken into consideration. So I've written extensively on the subject and my first book was focused on energy poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. And this really gives you an, um, an overview of what energy poverty means, what energy access means, and also the latest book is focused on energy transitions. It has contributions from different uh, experts. And in that book, we also introduced the novel concept of energy progression. So you can reach out to me if you really uh, want to get some of these books, the different books and also different uh, book chapters, journal articles. So in the 21st century, in this, uh, in this era of energy transitions and climate change, we're seeing high oil and gas prices in 2022. We're seeing more investments in fossil fuels. We're seeing countries considering subsidies in the fuel sector. So just by these three, uh, by these three highlights, you're asking, is the world really transitioning to a low carbon economy? Oh, we are playing games. I did a video which I called the energy security ball games. That really clearly shows that when you talk about the geographies of energy transitions, you will notice that some countries seem to be, some countries or some regions seem to be having an upper hand 
on what energy security should mean or how energy security should be taken seriously. When we saw the, 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 the global energy crisis, how it was impacting Europe and America, we saw President Joe Biden asking OPEC to increase, to pump more oil. We saw Europe looking everywhere to get the resources, oil and gas. But remember, the same countries uh, just uh, three years back, different institutions from those countries were passing policies to ban funding for oil and gas. So who exactly decides when we should transition to a low carbon economy and when we should not? Which citizens are more important when it comes to access to energy? Because when you talk about the energy sector, you also have to um, uh, for instance, we're all aware of the UN SDG 7, which is focused on uh, energy access. And most people think it's easy to really have access to energy, but it's not. It's not just having access to oil and gas. You also have to think about the issues of affordability. How many people can access that energy? How much are they paying for the energy bills? Because now that is an issue in, the, in, in all countries. But besides the affordability, what about the accessibility? Is there infrastructure to ensure that these people have access to this energy? So all these are issues that are complex and that cannot really be defined by this simple term that we call energy transitions. It's something that we really need to look deep into because once we fail to understand what we are talking about or what, the, what problem we are solving, that means that we're going to have misconceived solutions. And those misconceived solutions we have seen, they've led to disaster in the energy sector. I was giving an example in 2020, um, the European Investment Bank passed a policy that was to the effect that they had to ban funding for oil and gas. But then in 2022, uh, the same region Europe, they are passing policies to call some fossil fuels to term them as green energy. And these are all games people are playing because at the end of the day, you realize that no one is transitioning from anything. So it's basically energy progression. Now, um, obviously some of the reasons as to why uh, the world is focused on the issue of energy transitions like the previous speaker mentioned is the need to tackle climate change as uh, stipulated in the 2015 Paris Agreement. And climate change is real. It's a very real issue that we really need to tackle. As we see, it's also goal 13 of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. But the question is, how are you tackling this climate change? Is it really that the only way you can tackle climate change is to have a wholesome energy transition Oh, there are different ways you can tackle climate change, like embracing clean technology, like carbon capture, and also uh, uh, coming up with initiatives that are really like you to tackle the impacts of climate change. So all this we need to ask ourselves, how are we achieving some of these UN Sustainable Development Goal? Is it practical to achieve goal 13 on climate action? And then at the same time, when you're escalating uh, SDG, the challenge of SDG 1, like poverty eradication, or is there a way we can strike a balance to ensure that as we're tackling climate change, countries are not left behind when it comes to tackling their energy challenges? Because right now, many people don't have access to electricity. And even those who have, 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 who, who have access to electricity, they're finding it hard to pay for this electricity or they're finding it hard to pay for energy bills. So how are you going to strike that balance of tackling climate change and ensuring energy security? And the issue of energy transition is not the answer because we have seen in the 21st century, we have seen in 2022, that countries will forget about all their commitments, climate change commitments, when it comes to ensuring their energy security. We have seen it in Europe. We have seen it with the escalation of the Russian and Ukrainian war. So when we're talking about the geographies of energy transition, we just have to accept the fact that countries are progressing from one energy use to another. 
And when countries are progressing, they should be given enough time, they should be given access to the resources that will ensure that they move at their pace when it comes to tackling their different energy challenges. So the geopolitics when it comes to energy transition lies in the fact that previously we saw lots of initiatives and lots of pressure from the global north asking the global south or developing countries that it's time to leave some of your resources in the ground. But when faced with the global energy crisis, now you will see the geographies turning around in that the same people or same people who are saying, oh, it's time for you to leave the resources in the ground, it's time for you to transition, to have a wholesome transition. Now they're running to African countries and other countries to secure more oil and more gas for their citizens. So that is very important because the issue of energy transition is a global issue. And the energy sector is a very expensive sector. So if there are financial risks internationally, then even the countries that have resources that really wish to utilize these resources, they might find it hard to utilize them because of the financial risks that's uh, associated with the energy transitions. So that is something really that we need to take into consideration. In this graph, I, uh, it shows uh, issues of energy access, electrification, because it's also very important when you're talking about energy transitions, you need to understand that different countries and different regions face different energy challenges. So you cannot have a, a one solution for all the different challenges countries are facing. You need to be genuine, you need to be practical and, and understand that some countries will require uh, different solutions in order for them to be able to tackle their energy challenges. And also this is very important, especially when I talk about the geographies of energy transitions and, ge and the geopolitics. So here we already talked about the different energy that countries are using. Uh, we we so-called and you're seeing that fossil fuels are still playing a big role when it comes to the energy security, meeting the energy needs of different countries. But it doesn't mean that if a country is focused on using fossil fuels, they're not utilizing renewables. So countries have been transitioning to a low carbon economy from time immemorial. Different countries are relying on hydropower for their electric electricity generation. Different countries have invested in solar and wind and also wind energy. And uh, other countries are embracing natural gas, which is sometimes referred to, referred to as a transition energy. So this energy transition that we are talking about, it has been happening in, for a very long time because it's not only in the 20th century or 21st century that we are seeing countries relying on renewables. Countries have been relying on renewables for a very long time. But the problem is how the concept has been used, how the concept has been misused by different institutions, different organizations, the confusion it has brought. And you're like, why is there confusion when, it, when, it were to, when people are talking about energy transitions? It shouldn't be there because countries have for a long time been investing in renewables. But the problem is most people think when you're talking about energy transition, then it means you have to leave renew, uh, fossil fuels. No, that's not true. And that's a misconception that really has to be resolved. And for me, uh, that's why I came up with the concept of energy progression to show that it might take some time for people to progress from one energy use to another. It takes time, it takes a lot of finances. And as people are progressing, as we're going through this energy progression, we shouldn't see a lot of pressure from outside to first countries to leave their resources in the ground. So that misconception really has to be tackled. In the recent, <clears throat> in the recent publication that, uh, that we released, we came up with the energy transition indicators for Africa. And this is really very important because when you're talking about energy transitions, like I mentioned, it's a very wide concept. Now, here we're looking at, at, at these indicators what should be the measure of knowing how countries are progressing when it comes to energy transitions. First, you have to look at the electrification rate or energy access indicators. 
you need to ask yourself as a country, how many people have access to electricity? You need to take into consideration issues of energy poverty, specifically affordability. How many people, if they have the access, can they afford it? Then if this is in the negative and most people don't have access to electricity, then you don't have, you have no right to even rush into this energy transition thinking that you can only utilize renewables to tackle this challenge because right now, countries are still utilizing fossil fuels and renewables and we're seeing a high level, a high rate of number, a high, a high rate of people who are not electrified. The other issue is the deployment of electric vehicles because with energy transitions, we are focused on shifting to a low carbon economy and the transport sector sometimes contributes greatly when it comes to the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So how, how many countries are relying on electric vehicles? If the number is in your country is less than 20, it's less than 20%, then you, you really have to rethink whatever measures you are taking when it comes to energy transitions. Then the deployment of renewable energy, uh, how much a renewable energy is being used in the country and what's the level of investments, then this is also something that really has to be looked into. And then the energy efficiency technologies, they're also very important when you talk about energy transitions. Uh, how many countries are embracing the energy efficiency technologies? This is something that really has to be taken into consideration. Then the deployment of smart meters and smart grids. Can countries really afford, can people afford these smart meters and smart grids? The enabling the good framework, what's the, view when it comes to renewable energy uh, regulation or even fossil fuel regulation, then economic development, because in the, when I was starting, I mentioned that the energy sector is very key for the economic development of every, of every country. And with energy transitions, or we also have to think about the issue of minerals, critical minerals, like uh, what the previous speaker mentioned, because the critical minerals are very key for these energy efficient technologies. They are very key for the deployment of electric vehicles. They are also very key for renewable energy, like solar, solar panels, wind turbines. All these use uh, different minerals. So here, with economic development, you have to incorporate the issue of natural resources, both oil, gas, renewables, but also the issue of minerals. So, what is the economic development in the country? Can they really do without these minerals? Can they do with the wholesome energy transition or they need to first develop themselves and ensure that they also reach a level that the different developed countries are at before you think about leaving your resources in the ground. And then the availability of finances to transition to a low carbon economy. Who's going to finance this energy transition? Are you going to rely on, do uh, on donor money? Or can your country finance its move to transition to a low carbon economy. And the practical way really is here, especially the last one is, it's very easy if countries utilize their resources to get the revenue from oil and gas to use it to transition to a, low, to a low carbon economy. It's better than you relying on donor money and relying on other countries to help you finance this energy transition. So, Practically, it will be easy for countries to utilize both fossil fuels and renewables and find ways of managing their revenues very well to ensure that they utilize the revenues from fossil fuels to transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a paper on the energy transition indicators in Africa, so you can look out for that. So basically, um, the energy transition, it's just a dilemma of how you can tackle climate change and at the same time tackle energy poverty. And solving that dilemma is not something that is very easy because in, the, uh, in 2022, even 2021, we saw the fuel prices in Europe and everyone who thought that it was time to say goodbye to fossil fuels was very quiet because this dilemma is not something that can be solved very easily. In 2021, we saw more investments in coal and everyone who thought that if it was time for the world to say goodbye to fossil fuels was very quiet when people were making more investments in coal. 
in 2021, we saw the rising, the rising role of OPEC and all the countries that thought that the oil and gas, the era of the oil and gas sector has ended, they were very quiet. I saw some people used to contact me when we were talking about the dilemma of climate change and energy transitions. Most people would contact me and be like, oh, Victoria, the Stone Age era did not end because of uh, lack of stones. So they were comparing this to the energy sector that the fossil fuel era is not going to, it will not end because people have run out of oil. I'm like, that, that's, that's not even practical. Sometimes you think that we're no longer in the Stone Age era, but go, go to some rural areas in Africa, people are still using the, those uh, stone, uh, the, the, the stone stoves to cook. They're still using firewood to cook. That is something that was really used in the, in the, <clears throat> in the Stone Age era, but people are still doing it right now. So this is very important because you cannot judge what is happening in the other world, in the developed world, and you feel like, oh, we're no longer in the Stone Age era. We're no longer, we're no longer in the coal era, in the oil and gas era. Who has told you that? Different countries face different challenges. And that's why we are, are myself, I advocate for energy progression because people have to progress at their rates. Countries have to progress at their rate. Regions have to progress at their rate because they face different energy challenges. They face different economic challenges. And those challenges have to be taken into consideration before you rush into things that are going to be disastrous uh, in future. So uh, still the dilemma we saw with all the climate change uh, initiatives in the 21st century, we saw more investments in, in oil and gas, and also uh, the oil prices have been climbing at a very high rate, reaching uh, $85 per barrel in November 2021 but it also reached 100 at a certain point. So in summary, the issues of energy transitions and the geographies of energy transitions, they are things that we really need to take into consideration, the civil society, the policymakers, and we find practical ways of tackling this challenge because once we rush into solutions that we feel are guided by emotions because you feel it's time to uh, tackle the climate change challenges, you're going to escalate the other challenges in the different regions. So we don't need to rush. Instead of a wholesome energy transition, let's have energy progression so that people, countries, regions, they are not rushed into things that they will not be able to handle. So uh, I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Victoria. And uh, um, there are questions that have come through. I like the idea of energy progression. There are questions that have come through from participants um, that uh, I'll be reading out to you after we hear from Titus. But before we hear from Titus, I would like to request everyone, maybe if we can turn on our videos for a photo session, a quick photo session uh, from my colleagues, and then uh, we can continue um, and hear from Titus. And I think if everyone smiles like Titus, we will get a good photo. <laughs> Not everyone is a Zimbabwean. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, I think with that, welcome, Titus. Uh, no, thanks very much, my brother. Um, and uh, many, many thanks to, to your organizers um of, of of this important meeting um I'm, I'm also very happy to see colleagues uh, from oxfam i'm a proud ex oxfamer i mean i did seven years uh, based in maputo will always be proud of my association with with those colleagues and congratulations for putting together an important conversation i, I think important um in many ways because of um some of the real erudite um, 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 uh, uh, thoughts that uh, Dr. Narulele just mentioned. Um, she, she, she spoke with devastating clarity 
um, on 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 the hypocrisy of the moment. And and um, I, I will skip some of the um, details um, that probably are repetition. Um, and 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 take the conversation um, um, in a slightly different but related um, related strand. But really, uh, many thanks, Doc, for 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 for, for those very very useful thoughts. Um, I, I want to start essentially um, with uh, problematizing the whole narrative um, of um, energy transition, um, just to build on uh, previous speaker. I, I really want to problematize that. And I put it to you that the concept of energy transition isn't really something that is coming out of Africa. It's not an organic concept. Um, one could even argue it's, it's Western. I, I struggle to imagine where in Africa uh, the concept of energy transition as currently espoused and formulated is coming from. Um, and, and I have two reasons um, uh, to mention that, especially when we talk about um, energy, energy transition um, as, 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 as our path to energy zero, uh, to net zero. I put it to you colleagues that we are already on net zero much of the continent. We are literally, and that is the problem that we are on net zero already. I mean, as of 2018, many of you will remember about 789 million people don't have access to electricity. And the, the vast majority of those are, are, are in Africa. Um, 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 they lack any modern um, conceptualization of, 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 of electricity. And even those regions that have large economies like your South Africa, what the average annual per capita electricity consumption is often under 200 kilowatts. Um, in, in fact, the average African uses less energy than a typical American refrigerator. I mean, there is the one research that came out. And what Californians use in video games per annum um, in terms of energy is more than what Nigeria uses or Kenya uses entirely for energy. Uh, so wh what are we even talking about? We are on net zero. Um, th there is no transition to talk about, transition from using our muscles to where. So in some cases you wonder whether this is a conversation for us or is a conversation that we are being forced to, to participate in. The conversation in Africa is how do we improve energy access for the six, 100 million people who still use muscles and, and who live in mud houses who have no access to electricity. This is the narrative that we need to push. How do we get energy access for our people? How do we um, 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 get rid of energy poverty? And how do we hold people accountable for the ecological damage that they cause? For me, that is the narrative that is important because many of us um, are still using muscles and animals pulling plows for agriculture. Almost every African knows this is what is happening in the rural area. Look at the historical um, emissions. I mean, historical emissions are important because from 1850 to about 2010, um, um, uh, we know that it was US, it was EU, it was Canada, it was Russia, um, which basically contributed the most. 48 sub-Saharan African countries outside South Africa collectively and this is home to about a billion people, are responsible for just about 0.55% cumulative um, emissions. Um, so this is what net zero looks like. And sometimes what has happened in South Africa becomes generalized across the continent. But the truth is, as a continent, we really have done nothing. Um, so if there's a transition to talk about, we have to transition to energy first, modern energy, um, before we start talking about it. So for me, this is a crucial departure point when you're talking about energy transition. What are we talking about? Whose dis discussion are we talking about? And, and who does it benefit? The second issue is obviously around just where are we in terms of global primary energy consumption by source? Um, 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 Professor Bachelors Mill, who has shaped my thinking on energy, um, has said something um, quite important. He says, uh, we are still uh, a civilization that is founded on fossil fuels. So ours remains a, a, a fossil fuel civilization. That is not an opinion, that, that is analysis. Uh, it's not even an ideological position. It's an analysis of fact that where we are right now, we still remain a civilization of fossil fuels. The good news is we are seeing progress with wind and solar, uh, but we're only at 6% of energy um, um, generation, up from 0. 
two percent in 2000. So from 2000, wind and solar were 0.2 percent. Now we are on six seven percent. Well, that is uh, a positive trajectory, but that also tells you that this is um, more evolutionary than revolutionary. Um, the good news also is that since 2010, the average cost of electricity from solar has fallen by 73 and 22 percent respectively. So what you're also seeing is um, 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 renewable energies, especially solar and wind, are becoming much cheaper. We are becoming much better at this. So this is supposed to inspire action. This is supposed to inspire humanity that we probably are going somewhere. But the six or seven percent should be sobering. Uh, that we are not moving as fast as we should, and we are not moving as fast as we think we are. We are still very much dependent on these dirty fuels, and that is actually um, at the, the point that um, um, troubles me because that's where we are. And then we say, how do we make it um, faster? Having said, or having actually mentioned those two things, I will mention that um, 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 in, in, in current nomenclature, a transition to um, an energy transition that we're talking about. Its main story is really the rise of renewables. This is what I want to put it to you, that the main story about transition right now, it is the rise of renewable, particularly solar and wind, and the future, underscore, future decline of fossil fuels. Um, and the key issue that we need to analyze about renewables and what that then means in terms of energy uh, geopolitics is that um, real, uh, renewables are in a sense different in many respects from fossil fuels. And these differences do have geopolitical um, um, consequences. For example, renewable sources are available in one form or another in most countries. Um, 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 the sun is ubiquitous, wind is also ubiquitous in a sense, unlike fossil fuels that are connected or concentrated in specific geographic locations. For example, we all know there is oil in Qatar, there is oil in, in Venezuela, and it's concentrated in specific countries. Whereas sun, though it does not shine with equal intensity and is a variable resource, though we have wind, which doesn't move with the same velocity everywhere, it's, it's generally distributed. And that is geopolitical um, implications. And if done intelligently, this could reduce our current energy choke points. Right now, we do have energy choke points. Um, I mean, some of you who are students of international relations, you know what we call the, the Strait of Malacca problem, where you have to overcome the Strait of Malacca problem, which is a widely used sea routes that are critical to global supply of oil. Um, and, and, and when you have control over that Strait of Malacca, um, it means others are actually taken out. So when you do have solar and wind as potential um, sources of abundant energy, what you're talking about is a future democratizing impact or effects of, 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 of renewable energy. And so what am I talking about? I'm saying we could witness in the future power shifts. I'm talking geopolitics. We could see power shifts. Um, geographic concentration of oil, gas, and coal um, um, in the past is what configured international geopolitical landscape. Coal and steam uh, is what drove um, um, the Industrial Revolution, as you all remember, and it is what shaped a geopolitics of the 19th century. So a transition from fossil fuels to renewables could potentially transform global power relations. Eh? It could reposition states because a state relative position in the international system um, is often influenced by a range of attributes, which is your GDP, your population. So Nigeria is big, India is big. So that matters, international relations, your land size, your resources. Saudi Arabia is important because of oil. I mean, uh, MBS could kill uh, 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 Jamal Khashoggi, may he so rest in peace, and no one touches it. And we know why. It is because they have oil. So the state's re relative position in the international um, uh, system has a lot to do currently with what you have in terms of natural resources. So having control and access of significant energy markets is an important asset, um, which could en enable um, national interests at home and make you leverage economic and political influence abroad. So when you're now talking about renewables, uh, you're talking about potentially democratized power and, and neutralizing the power and authority of certain states that used to be that important. So this growth potentially of renewables could likely alter power and influence of some states and regions relative to others and literally redraw um, the world's geopolitical map. Um, and how different countries will fare in the context of energy transition will really depend in small part um, 
um, uh, in, in where they are. And equally positioned and equally important, I think, is that um, um, within the clean energy race, the commercial race to become a leader in renewable energy technology is what is going to make countries more important. You're already looking at China. China controls half technology around wind. It is a leader in solar. You're seeing Germany, you're seeing. So you're also seeing a repositioning, a reconfiguration of certain powers because of where we are seeing. So countries that can innovate around renewable technology have potential to also change their own uh, geopolitical position. The other thing about renewables is that uh, they, are, they, they, they operate in flows, eh? whereas fossil fuels are stocks. Energy stocks can be stocked, um, which is useful, but they can all be used only once. In contrast, energy flows don't exhaust themselves, and they are much harder to disrupt. And this is key for power. Energy uh, sources can also deploy, be deployed at any scale and lend themselves better to decentralized uh, forms of energy production. That's why you talk about small grids, mini grids. This is useful in terms of power and how sometimes centralized governments um, can leverage their power. So this is all part of what I'm talking about when I'm saying um, a renewable energy has potential to democratize power within the international system. Um, what we're also seeing potentially in the geopolitical context is that um, renewables could bring new actors, new companies, new cities, new corporation. You are seeing Tesla right now. We used to have Exxon. And Exxon is still important. I'm not trying to say it's not important. But what you're also seeing with the energy transition is the rise of new corporations, new cities, new actor within the international system. And this also means you're going to see a different redrawing um, of relations. You're also going to see shifting of alliances. You know, um, Alliances are, are like OPEC have always been are based on fossil fuels, then they remain important and were always important. But what you can also see is a shifting alliance um, 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 in the next decade as other kinds of um, fossil fuels change. You will also see potentially a shifting geographies of, uh, geographies of, um, of trade. Renewables will reconfigure new geographies of connections and, and dependence. Um, in broad daylight, we'll see the, a, a shift of, from global markets to regional grids. So instead of talking about regional, you're really going to see regional grids. Countries that today import oil from one side of the world will seek to develop renewables at home to integrate their grids with those of neighboring countries. So it will be important for Uganda to be in good books with their neighbor because that's how grids operate. Huh? Uh, you can't move from, um, electricity for uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers, it becomes weaker. But what happens um, will be you will be talking about regional grids. And so relations between countries, neighboring countries, um, is going to be important. Electricity is going to take center stage and is going to be important. So technology around um, electricity, smart grids, storage technology, innovation around high voltage transmission that minimizes loss could also be important. And countries that can demonstrate capacity in that area are also going to be important. Rethinking energy statecraft. This is uh, energy agency analysis that um, um, st states have always used energy resources as instruments for foreign policy. We all know Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, the US, Canada, they've used energy um, um, as instruments of foreign policy. Qatar, uh, that's called energy statecraft. In a world powered by renewables, energy resources will lose much of their currency in the future. Uh, one time, Jimmy Carter said, uh, no one can ever embargo the sun or interrupt his delivery to us. Um, and, 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 and so this is important. So the possible consequence of this energy trans transformation would to reduce the geostrategic importance of oil and gas as tools of foreign policy. Now, when we're talking about trends, trends, these are not trends that you are going to see tomorrow. Eh? You are talking about trends over time. But what is important as African policymakers is to begin to plan with those trends well ahead. The problem is, because something may not happen until 2045, we don't want to plan for that. And this is why we've always lagged behind. Think about the possibility of one day when energy is no longer a, a, a foreign policy instrument. So what becomes your own policy instrument? We've already seen with the Ukraine war. You know, there's a statement that says war is the locomotive of history. The Ukraine war didn't teach us anything. In fact, it has sped, it speeds processes up. What it does is it's trying to cause countries to be more inward looking, diversify their own um, sources 
they are not necessarily diversifying the actual fuels. We're actually seeing countries drilling even more, but you're also going to see countries diversifying um, imports and things like that. And, 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 and you're also going to see some potentially um, doing more in terms of ramping up potential for renewables. But the sad thing is Ukraine war has come with a rise of both extraction of fossil fuels and a greater investment in, in, in renewables. And this is where we are. And as I draw to a close, I want to talk about what this could mean for African countries. And there are three basic points I'm making. That energy transition um, um, should be a moment for African countries to call for justice over ecological catastrophe. We've already talked about the fact that Africa is at net zero. We have done nothing um, about where we are in terms of energy, um, uh, in terms of emissions. All this that you're seeing in terms of uh, floods and all these, Anthropo anthropogenic climate change. It's not us. There are countries, states, companies that are responsible for that. And we need justice for that. And, and we need to take a position as African CSOs, African academics, and African states that we know who did this, when and what. So the key thing for me, especially as we work towards COP27, is loss and damage facility. And I know Kerry, John Kerry, uh, you know, energy envoy of the US, I'm told the influence, the discussion from an energy loss and damage dialogue from loss and damage facility. What we need is a loss and damage facility so that African countries have the finance to adapt and to address the issues structurally that have made us not be able to have access to energy. Uh, and also address the issues that allow us to respond to rising temperatures, rising tides and all these things. So we need a key message across the continent as we approach Egypt, loss and damages facility. Because a lot of what we are talking about, changing grids, uh, improving mini grids, investing in renewables, improving adaptation, transition to wind and solar, it requires money. And the question is, where is the money going to be paid for? The money has to come from the people who cause the problem to happen. At the moment, what we have is the case of the bandits teaching morals to the victim. The bandit has to pay for what they did, if I have to use more aggressive terminology. That the ones who polluted, the ones who caused this are the ones who are supposed to pay. The second is climate finance, which is what was promised 100 billion. We have not seen it. Some of you were in Glasgow last year, you know that South Africa was promised about 8.5 billion. We have not seen it. It's not new money. So also aggressively move around. We need concessional loans and grants for climate finance so that our countries can adapt, so that our countries can, um, can, can transition. The third aspect of finance is reinvigorating domestic capital markets, uh, which is where we have to unleash and invigorate domestic capital markets in Africa. We're seeing it in Asia. That transition is actually investment in renewables uh, is something that is being led by domestic capital markets. So there are pension funds, um, there are state banks, the African diaspora, the Asian diaspora. We really have to begin to coordinate and involve them. Um, in, in part of this. The second thing is to use, to see energy transition as a business opportunity for Africa. Why am I saying this? Countries have made enormous amount of money through fossil fuels. And countries are also going to make enormous amount of money through a low, 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 carbon, um, um, a low carbon trajectory or low carbon technologies. So this is the moment to start thinking industrial policy of African countries. Industrial policy around your resources, it's also in time to start thinking about um, a situation where um, gas is seen more as a transition fuel, which is cleaner um, than coal. Hydrogen for Namibia, um, South Africa, Zimbabwe have got platinum, which are all catalysts for hydrogen fuel cell uh, technology. So it is important to actually see the opportunity that comes with energy transition and the business opportunity that also comes with climate change. So much of the conversation right now is around protection from the impact. It's around adaptation, but we also don't see this as a way. Look at China, which is one of the biggest polluters. The level of investment they have done and the money they are making through um, ring fences, um, rare earth minerals, through battery processing. Look at what is happening in, in, in Germany, which now is about 13,000 patterns around renewables. Africa cannot just boast of being hot. We also have to begin to say, let's industrialize. Let's see this as an opportunity to leap ourselves ahead. The third aspect, which is also important, is 
building resilience against energy transition shocks. And the best way to do that is to improve governance. You know, a decline in fossil fuel rents in the future is the potential to profoundly destabilize countries that have not prepared their economies sufficiently for the consequences. So countries begin to say, how do we diversify your Nigeria, your Angola, your Mozambique before you start extracting gas in Palma? Start to think about a way out. So I do support what Mozambique is trying to do today. We are going to use our gas to produce fertilizer. And fertilizer is going to also improve our agriculture, processing and stuff like that. And the loss of rents in countries with weak governance like Congo could lead to fractures in society and political instability. You will remember that a drop in oil price in the 80s was one of the contributing factors to the decline and fall of, of the Soviet Union. The other thing about improving governance is to build state capacity. And this is going to be crucial, not just resourcing civil society, but to actually say, we have to reflect on building state capacity. If there is anything that we have learned with oil and gas system is that African um, governments have been very weak, unable to negotiate, unable to write laws. And as we think about a low carbon future, Think about what that means in terms of state capacity. So open governments, respect for community rights, particularly as countries begin to um, um, compete for battery mineral projects, cobalt, rare earths, um, um, graphite, um, lithium. There's going to be competition for that. And a lot of these resources are occurring in countries with weak government systems. So we have to really think about the capacity of government, the laws around the community rights and preparing companies with less capacity to deal with the, the, the community. One of the things that is also happening within this uh, period that we are in is a different profile of company is now involved in mining. Look at the country companies that are looking at DRC right now. I'm sure you remember on Twitter when um, um, Elon Musk was saying, we have to get into mining, you know, vertical integration, we want to secure supply lines. So yeah, you are likely to see a future in which Tesla is owning mines, BMW is owning mines, potentially Apple or Microsoft. These are not companies that are well-skilled with community engagement and things like this, which also means that our state can no longer rely on Rio Tinto public engagement department to deal with communities. We have to build this capacity internally within the state and within our civil society to prepare for intensifying um, competition of our resources. Second last is we have to mitigate against social dislocation. Social dislocation because you are seeing a race for control of supplies around rare earths, you're seeing a race around lithium, you're seeing a race around cobalt, um, you're seeing China actually trying to leverage um, its control of cobalt, rare earths, and to use it geopolitically. So there could be social dislocation as there is intense fighting around mines and towns across Africa where the resources are. But you also could see dislocation as we begin to weed ourselves, particularly from resources like coal. Um, uh, if you ask me, I am more optimistic about gas as a transition fuel as I have around coal. It's still very important, but you will see less and less takers in the future. Uh, even though for now you might still have a bump, but when you start looking about 50, 60 years, I think you will see newer forms, in my opinion, um, instead of coal. So there could be social dislocation, and we have to start thinking around mitigation, social dislocation. When you're looking at places like Mpumalanga, where 80% of the jobs there are actually co-related. Uh, majority of the coal plants in South Africa are in Kumalanga. So what happens the day we say, let's shut down coal? One day that day will, will come. What happens to those stuff? What happens to the town of Mpumalanga? So let's start thinking. When you start talking about, this is where I always say, oh, let's just shut down our coal tomorrow. Um, think about what, ha what happens to the stuff. What happens to Mpumalanga, where your vice president comes from? Think about what it means in terms of political instability. So mitigate social dislocation now. And governments should be at the forefront of thinking, where are the jobs for the guys who are going to move out of coal? Where are the jobs for the guys who are going to be moved out of coal? Even before we talk about transition, some are going to be moved out of coal through basic math, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, 300 kilometers north, uh, is it southeast of Bamako in Mali, you now find the first fully first fully automated mine in the world. Um, so you're also seeing the fourth industrial revenue taking out jobs. So jobs are being taken away from, from a lot of mining projects, whether or not we are talking about energy transition. So mitigating social dislocation is going to be one of the major roles of government. Last but not least, 
resist dogmatic positions, counter narratives, um, and adopt flexible country specific trajectories. Part of my problem that we're seeing with World Bank and the G G7 tape coming out of um, um, uh, Glasgow was, okay, we are all committed to not funding new gas projects. The same countries that signed that piece of um, a paper are busy negotiating for new projects, actually encouraging their own industry to fund new projects. And so I find dogmatic position on Africa and global south hypocritical. And yet amongst themselves, these countries that are polluters are quite flexible with themselves. So as civil society, we also have to resist these dogmatic positions that are rigid um, against the victim countries that have energy poverty, uh, that don't have money and that are debt ridden. So flexibility and a greater sense of justice in dealing with these things. Finally, and I then second last point, which was actually the second last point, is the role of the state. When we think about the energy transition, what you want to do is to ensure that we guard ourselves from reproducing the structural weaknesses of the prevailing extractive fossil fuel-based centered economy. The new one, I come from Oxfam, where we say the new state should, we have to re-standard the role of states as the principal and the fair brokers of economic redistribution and government sustainability. So we're not just talking about the rules here. We are saying we actually have to rethink and recenter the role of specific stakeholders within the economy as we transition. Recenter the role of states as the principal and fair broker. States taking leadership, and we're already seeing this in China, the, the, the entities that are taking leadership over renewables and companies, it was states, it was the Chinese government, it was the German government, it was the US government. And so you are also seeing a recentering of the role of states within the energy transition. And for Africa, it's going to be important because much of policy making on the continent has become external. It's happening elsewhere. The oil and gas system was extracted and exploited. And it, at its core, it was interested in capital accumulation as the main objective. Huh? What we shall now, what we must now envisage is a transition to a new form of economy that is beyond capital accumulation as the main objective. An economy that is centered around people and planetary well being. An economy that is ecologically regenerative. The questions of production and consumption will have to be new and revisited in particular. You know, 30, 40 years ago, we are coming from a system where if you can produce for 24 hours, chrome, Call, do so, as long as there is a market for it. In a new economy, which I envisage as we transition into the new world, we have to envisage an economy where production is limited and just. Production is kept. Production is about well-being, not capital accumulation and profits. This seems abstract, but this is important. We start envisaging the role of our states and the role of economics and the economic system that we want want as a people as we transition into a new economy and into new energies. Thank you very much, colleague. Thank you so much, um, Titus, for that powerful presentation. Um, and now um, we have questions coming from the audience, but um, I really appreciate having, um, you, having you shared with us um, the principles that uh, we should uh, uh, peg our transition on. Um, and one of the questions that is coming from um, the audience is that um, how do we ensure um, that Africa participates fully um, in the value chain uh, of energy transition, including um, participating, um, benefiting from the minerals that come from um, our continent that contribute to the development of renewable energy technologies? Um, the participants are asking because um, they tend to think that um, African Union and the African Union Parliament um, is only depending on the legislation that are developed in the North. And uh, they seem not to be doing enough um, within to be able to develop uh, the much needed um, strategies that will drive the transition and will ensure that Africa benefits from this transition. So um, I don't know who's gonna take that, uh, if it's uh, Victoria or Titus, but because Titus, you've already started um, trying to uh, speak to the principles and strategies that we need to approach as we call for justice. Uh, I think you can have a first go then, Victoria. 
So for me, we, we have to go back to the finance issue. You start with justice. Uh, after justice, then you address structural issues within our economy. I think it is true that we cannot remain um, uh, from mind to cost economies. I think we have to do value addition. We have to move from local content to regional content, which is where the Africa mining region comes from. I do, I am a firm believer in exploring value chains, whether it's around fertilizer, uh, DRC and Zambia are pursuing potential discussions around batteries. And so thinking through um, adding value to our battery minerals um, is going to be important now. The truth of the matter is it's much complex. It's much more complex in practice than it is. Eh? Um, even the US as we speak, and then this will surprise a lot of people. They currently don't have the kind of technology that China has around battery processing. So the question that I have for African governments that keep saying China is our all weather friends is China is actually the leading company, country on battery minerals and a lot of the technologies that we need. Why can't we leverage our relationship with China to say China, um, transfer of technology should be on the table because at the moment I'm not seeing that. So for me, number one, you want a policy framework that accepts that we have to add value where possible and where feasible financially to some of these minerals, particularly the, the battery minerals. Secondly, we need to have a much more robust conversation with China as an African platform around transfer of technology, particularly around battery minerals. The third one is, for us to finance a lot of these, we have to win on loss and damages. Comrades, if we fail on loss and damage, a lot of these will just be blueprints. We have to find the money from somewhere. Either we'll find it as commercial rates, we'll find it as concessional loans, we'll find this as grants, or we have to find it through the just means of loss and damages facility. This is how we'll get the money to finance a lot of these processes. Thank you, Titus. Victoria, do you have an addition to that? No, I, I don't have an addition. I think Titus has done justice to that question. Oh, thanks. Uh, before I go to the next question, uh, Victoria, you mentioned about um, the EU now um, changing uh, its tone. Uh, previously, it had um, said that it's not going to finance fossil fuel investments in developing countries, including Africa. But now with the current Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, we have seen them uh, shift. Now um, the EU yesterday, just yesterday, um, entered into a deal with Egypt uh, for Egypt to supply them with gas. And uh, we have seen them, um, part of the EU governments like Germany, court now Senegal, and finance uh, promise to finance uh, gas development in Senegal. Um, do you think this should be happening or um, energy transition, energy uh, development in Africa should happen on African terms and not uh, affect on the outside um, terms? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, like uh, I mentioned, uh, I have a concept called the energy security book games. And uh, I think I'll share a video to that concept. This is a game because the energy sector and politics they are so interconnected concepts. Without energy, you will not have this politics that we're seeing. And if you look at um, the African energy resources, for a very long time, we have been playing the politics of other countries. We're talking about the issue of gas. Right now, every country is really focused on investing in gas in these African countries, like you've mentioned what happened uh, with the EU and the uh, deal in Egypt. But if you look at what has been happening, happening in Nigeria and West Africa for a very long time, you'll understand that we haven't been playing the energy security board games in Africa. For instance, that shows that the gas that was being played in Nigeria is capable of electrifying the entire ECOWAS region. We're talking about 15 countries. And for a very long time, the companies that have been operating in Nigeria were not really concerned about utilizing that gas because it was cheaper to flare that gas than to really commercialize it to the benefit of the people. And now, right now, because we're seeing this global energy crisis and the 
measures that are being taken by Russia, the, san the sanctions we are seeing, all of a sudden now countries and companies want to invest in this gas. But remember the regions that really need the natural resources, that need the gas, there haven't been measures to utilize that gas. Instead, we've been seeing gas flaring from country, from one country to another. So the question to that is every country should utilize the resources first to tackle the energy challenges they're experiencing in their own country. But unfortunately, given the, the fact that energy, uh, energy investments are very expensive ventures and we entirely rely on foreign investors, in most cases, the investors will move with an option that is cheaper for them. And that's why we are seeing that we are still talking about energy poverty on the African continent, and yet the continent has a lot of resources. How have the resources been utilized? We have been going with the easy ways of really utilizing the resources, getting the revenue, but then why not just first utilize those, the resources for your own people? And we're seeing like most people are excited because Europe now is turning to Africa for gas. And I see many people celebrating online or right now we're doing this. Why are you celebrating? The thing would be at least find ways of ensuring that the resources are first utilized in country before you are solving Europe's problems. So this is the hypocrisy that I really talk about in the energy sector. It's the politics that people are playing in this energy sector in that when some people feel that it's time for us now to utilize the gas, they will make the investments available. But then when other people feel that, you know, instead of flaring this gas, it can, it can electrify the entire ECOWAS region, 15 countries, we're talking about millions, more even billions of people, but you feel it's cheaper for you to flare that, that gas. So uh, in summary, I believe in this era, in this energy transition era, in this climate change era, the global South has a big role to play, but we need to place ourselves in ways whereby we can negotiate and not just be driven by what other people want. Because we have the resources, we have the energy, we have the oil, we have the gas, we have the minerals, the minerals, you can't have an energy transition without access to these critical minerals. We have to look at our laws and find ways of ensuring that the laws are in place, but they're also efficient enough to ensure that we utilize the resources. And this is something that is just beyond uh, the deals we are making with Europe, the deals we are making with America and all the other deals. It goes even to the contracts we are negotiating what are the provisions in those contracts? Um, I've, I've always been very open about issues of stabilization clauses, and I don't understand why in the 21st century countries are still offering stabilization clauses that are really leading to lots of disputes. Like those are the inner things we really have to look at and be like, what has been preventing us to benefit from these resources in the past? What can we do to solve some of these the, these challenges. And we have to be very bold because right now Africa really uh, has a strong say when it comes to the energy sector. It has a strong say when it comes to energy transitions. And it has a strong say when it comes to climate change. But the issue is how are you positioning yourself and what are demands, what demands, what kind of demands are you making? Oh, thanks so much. Um, a question from a participant. Um, is uh, about, I know Titus has put uh, forward great points on what we need to do going forward, the calls we need to be making. Uh, but, um, and I know Titus mentioned about um, building state capacity, building civil society capacity, but um, particularly what safeguards should we be putting in place to ensure that um, our communities, the people who work in the minerals uh, mining industry, uh, are benefiting from the full value chain of, um, uh, of, of, of the mineral extraction, but also um, in the whole energy um, development uh, scenarios.
Sorry, uh -huh. just question for who? Um, I think any of you, uh, Titus, Victoria, or an, anyone um, within the uh, panel, even if Peter can, can has something, you, you feel free to contribute. Well, there are many, well, I'll just do maybe two, two issues. There are many ways of, 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 of doing what, what you will, what you will notice in a lot of um, um, communities. I mean, I, I think I will um, combine that with Norman's question around uh, small, scale, small scale mining. A, a lot of these minerals occur in areas where you've got lots of able-bodied young men and women uh, who are actually participating um, in this mine, but we, we don't have a good small scale mining framework. On the continent, very few, very few countries. Um, at the moment, these are illegal. Uh, they are criminalized. They are bastardized. We consider them more harmful than some of the large corporations that have looted and caused so much illicit financial flows. So, for me, a good departure point is the best way to involve them is to also um, create an enabling framework for small-scale mining um, through proper legislation. Um, through pot, proper support services, um, through proper infrastructure so that they can sell to at good prices. Um, you can see the potential in, in, in DRC, no man is talking DRC. We have seen in Zimbabwe where at some point, majority of the gold produced was produced by small scale mines. So communities within the environment of this project should be integrated into this. But this should be part of a, a, a wider industrial policy within the country. Where the mining sector should not be an enclave economy, like the Kabinda enclave in Angola. Eh? It should be connected to the wider economy or to wider regional development within a community. And by so doing, then you start thinking about uh, infrastructure, spatial linkages, how do we maximize and which linkages should we maximize? And we have to go beyond the profit maximization. Uh, the moment you see minerals, all we think about is the stacks. We have to go beyond tax fiscal, um, uh, linkages to what are the other linkages, spatial, backwards, and, and maximize and create a space for that. And, and as you do that, create an ecosystem, an environment in which small-scale mining, which is usually dominated by young men and women, can also participate and produce. Evidence shows that they can actually produce. Um, having said that, I want to make a quick point around regional integration. Part of what we actually need is the spirit uh, of the Nguruma generation. You remember for Africa to be, liber uh, to, to be liberated, a lot of African countries sacrificed for the next country. So it was Tanzania sending countries, sending arms, sending soldiers, sending money. In some extent, we actually have countries that wreck their own economy for the liberation of another. Fast forward to current generation of finance ministers, most of them very neoliberal, Oxford, Harvard, blah, blah, blah. They have such a zero-sum game approach to regional development. You, you try to negotiate a regional road, they refuse because they think Zambia will lose 200,000. This was not the mentality of the liberation, general, uh, the, the liberation generation. So what I'm trying to say is how can we make use of the historical political solidarity in our regional communities and have that translate into a project for regional integration where African countries work together to produce regional infrastructure, regional electric grids, regional development around the Inga Dam. The Inga Dam can support energy for the entire continent. But to do that, some African countries have to accept that they may lose one or two points, but the whole region will succeed. So tap into that political solidarity reservoir and use that for economic benefit, like SADA. Oh, thanks so much. Um, in the interest of time, I see we are running um, out of time. Uh, but um, just a quick uh, question. Um, when we started in the opening remarks, Peter mentioned something around uh, stranded assets. And uh, um, the question that comes to my mind is, how do we make sure that um, as we transition, as we invest our little resources in the development of energy for access, um, trying to beat energy poverty on the continent, how do we ensure that we do not end up um, having invested the little resources in um, infrastructural uh, projects or energy projects that might strand our assets 
and, and, and render them uh, not very useful to the continent. Um, maybe Victoria? Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, maybe to address it uh, briefly, the issue of stranded assets uh, is an issue that has been um, recognized by different people. It's likely to happen for countries really that have the resources and then at the end of the day, they have exhausted the resources. But one way of solving that is uh, through regionalism. And by regionalism, it's like regional cooperation. Instead of having different uh, infrastructure developments for the same project uh, per country, countries can come up together and then um, put in place the same infrastructure that can be used by different countries. So in, in an instance where you have stranded assets or even stranded infrastructure, it's not like the same amount of, uh, like if it's, if each country is like to develop a refinery, because one of the reasons as to why we are not benefiting from the natural resources is the lack of refineries, uh, lack of lack of value addition. So instead of Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Kenya having a refinery per country, we can ensure that one region has like two refineries, so that in the event that resources are exhausted, those refineries can still run. Uh, being utilized by other countries that have the resources. So in the issue of the energy sector, uh, natural resource governance and also management, we have to understand that no country can make it on its own. You can have the resources, but you might not have the capacity to develop the infrastructure that is needed. You will need the investors, international investors. Sometimes you need the support of the neighboring countries. So we have to embrace regionalism, especially for countries that have similar energy challenges. Because uh, initially I mentioned that every different countries have different energy challenges and they have to have different solutions. But we have to recognize that with the issue of regionalism, most of the countries in the same region often have similar challenges. So you can employ similar solutions through regionalism and regional cooperation in that whatever solution Uganda embraces, it can be embraced by Kenya and we can come up with the resources because with the geographies of energy transition, each region is now focused on what benefits them. Right now we're seeing the global north, they are, they're into gas right now. They're looking for gas everywhere. They are moving, they're moving. They are really looking for gas. That is a, a regional cause. They have similar challenges and they're employing similar solutions as a region. They're coming in as Europe. And it's the same thing for Africa. Because if you notice, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, most regions have similar challenges. So we have to move in as a region. The role of the AU is very instrumental right now. What are the key things that they're putting in place as a region so that we come up as a region? Because Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, you cannot come on your own and you'll be like, these are the terms that we are putting in place for us to move forward with the energy sector. But once you come up as a region, then it will be easier for even to make strong demands. So uh, the summary to that is really, we have to embrace regionalism. I will share my book on regional cooperation and the development of the energy sector. Well, thanks so much, Victoria. Um, I think um, I would like, at this point, I would like to thank you all for joining us in this conversation and also more specifically to our panelists and speakers for the great insight that they have shared uh, with us on um, energy transition and energy development on the continent. Uh, we all appreciate your contribution and your active participation from all the participants. Um, uh, at this point, I will um, uh, take the mic to Moses, who will be sharing with us um, way forward and next steps um, or after this webinar. Uh, thanks everyone for your participation and uh, we really look forward for more engagement. As we all can see, uh, we cannot exhaust this topic in one and a half hours. Uh, to you, Moses. Thank you very much, Alex, for uh, Amos for the wonderful moderation. And once again, thank you so much for our distinguished uh, uh, speakers today, Dr. Victoria and Titus Gwemende. 
I think you have given us very good ideas and very controversial insights about this very wonderful topic. I'm very sure viewers and participants that you, you're leaving this seminar with a lot of insights. Some of you might be saying, hmm, I didn't think about that before, uh, which is also a very good way of learning. And I think this is the purpose of this convening, that we bring different insights and different views. And from this, hopefully we can be able to make some kind of very good insights and good decisions moving forward as a continent. You might have heard uh, in, the, in the speaker speaking a little bit more about two issues, one renewable energy, but also I saw in the charts and the questions coming about critical minerals. Yes, I want to tell you that the next steps is that our next session will be on renewable energy. And we hope that it will be taking place on the 6th of July, where we intend to have very good experts as well to bring us some insights about whether really renewable energy is the answer for Africa. And as again, as usual, we encourage you to register and join and be with us when we send out the links for, for that event. Thereafter, we shall also have one very final second last webinar, which will be on critical minerals. And this is around, made around August there about, and hopefully that shall also be able to join us. We know that there are some questions that we've not been able to answer today. And we hope that throughout uh, the next series of, 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 of webinars, we shall be able to understand them, but also be able to get, maybe speak to them. There are questions about the sharing of the videos. We intend to do that to whoever has registered. Uh, we have your email addresses, and I think this, uh, uh, this, uh, this videos will, uh, this recording will be coming forward. With all this, I want to thank again the, the, the steering committee, the six organizations. I want to thank Mr. Peter Kamaling of, from Oxfam for, for speaking today to us and providing the opening remarks. And of course, for Oxfam who have coordinated today's session. The next session will be coordinated by Parship to Africa. And again, as I said, most of you will be welcome. With those few remarks, I want to say thank you so much and looking forward to seeing you again. May God bless you. <laughs>